Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Bruner, and I am the Exotic Forest Pest Educator with Purdue University's Department of Entomology. Today, I want to talk to you about a rather unique plant pathogen that has entered the United States recently, known as beech leaf disease. Um, there are several interesting facts about this disease that are a little bit different than the other ones I've talked before on this series, and I really want to break it down so that way we can easily understand it and be prepared should, the, the, should this disease enter Indiana. So first off, this is, like I said, a little bit of a unique pathogen. It is invasive, like all the things I talk about. This is a type of nematode named Litolinchus crinitae mechanii. That's actually a subspecies, but that's just so you know what the scientific name of it is. This uh, organism, like I said, is a nematode, and it is a cosmopolitan worm. It, well, the group nematodes are cosmopolitan worms that can't typically be seen with the naked eye. They're very, very tiny, and they're usually either soil-borne or act as a parasite of either plants or even insects. Um, now, unfortunately, this disease, what we've discovered about it so far, is that when beech trees become infected, severely infected trees can die within two to seven years. So obviously, we want to make sure that we are protecting our beech, because even though we are in primarily an oak and maple-dominated landscape, we still have plenty of American and European beech that we want to protect. Now, it should also be kept in mind that there is no resistant strain of tree that we've developed. This is a relatively new disease, and it is, has been seen to be capable of infecting all species of beech, including those on different continents. So I can't underscore the importance of uh, us trying to understand this disease as much as possible. Now, like I mentioned, this is a nematode. This is an interesting little organism, and I want to go over a known model of nematode, so that way we can kind of all start from the same place and understanding what this disease really means, or what the pathogen really means. And I'm going to go over these pictures in a little bit more detail momentarily. So nematodes, we generally refer to them as roundworms, and they can play a really big role in human health and livestock management. Now, you are probably already familiar with a couple of species of roundworms. Some of the two most common that affect human health are Ascaris, which causes ascariasis in humans living in tropical areas, and Trichinella, which you know from the disease trichinosis that occurs when you do not cook pork long enough because the pathogen itself will infect swine herds. Now, nematodes can also have a big role in plant pathology, insect management, and in soil ecology as well. But let's talk momentarily about the first two. So with plant pathogen nematodes, these are parasites. They are going to use the biology of the plant to facilitate their own reproduction and their survival. And when they do so, it normally has a pretty deleterious effect on the plant's health itself representing a really nasty problem if you do, are doing something, say, growing crops or another valuable commodity that can become infected by a nematode. When we refer to uh, beneficial nematodes, oftentimes we could talk about entomopathogenic nematodes. These actually act as controls on insects. They will very particularly parasitize groups of insects, and you can even purchase these as products on the market right now intended to protect plants uh, like strawberries or similar berry developing crops against insects like cutworms and webworms and a variety of other things. These are great because it gives you a safe option to control insects. These nematodes will not jump from an insect to a plant or a person. They are, they are specific. They will stay with an insect. So you can use them and it doesn't represent any kind of threat to your business or human health. Now let's start with that model I was talking about. Let's start with one that we know very well, the soybean cyst nematode, or SCN. Those of you who have grown soybeans before probably know all about this, but a lot of us may not be as closely aware of it, so I want to make sure we cover it so you have an understanding of how a nematode will do its work. So first off, they can severely reduce the success of soybeans because what they'll do is as they feed and infect, they'll reduce the soybeans' ability to grow It'll cause stunting, it'll cause yellowing of leaves, which means that the plant is not getting as much food, it's not able to photosynthesize as much, ultimately resulting in a loss of yield. Now that damage alone can cost Indiana upwards of $50 million a year. Uh, that's a pretty big chunk of money, so obviously we want to make sure that we are protecting our soybean crops from this nematode. 
We can usually diagnose the problem by looking for female nematodes on the surface of roots. However, it can be challenging because when we look for them, they kind of resemble the same nodules that house rhizobium bacteria, which is a beneficial nitrogen fixing bacteria in a lot of legumes. These are, you'll find them on plants that you probably grow at home too. So it takes a lot of effort to identify them safely. So returning to these pictures I showed just a moment ago, let's kind of break down what they're showing us. Now, I was just talking about the nodules and where to find the female nematodes, and I'm highlighting right here what they look like. They do heavily resemble those same rhizobium nodules that are so important to nitrogen fixing. And then we can also look at this other image, and this is what we see on the outside. This is what we see above the ground. We can see that there's a portion of this field that has yellowing plants that are obviously smaller than the rest of the plants in the field. So you can guess that most likely that's a big area where there's going to be a severe yield loss when it comes time for harvest. And then these last two images are kind of showing you where the worms actually are. These are juvenile worms in a root hair. Someone went and took a soybean root hair, they probably cut it in half using a razor blade, and then they stained it so that way we can actually see the juvenile nematodes under a microscope. And they're just there feeding on the plant tissue, feeding on the same food that's going through the plant, and preventing the plant from being able to grow successfully. Now how does SCN spread? Well, the great thing is, is that these are really tiny worms. They don't get up and fly away. They're not crawling super fast. In fact, they can only move a few inches through the soil in a given year. So that is an intensely slow migration. That's glacial. However, we transport them, just like with many invasive species and diseases. We can transport the contaminated soil on equipment. So. If a field has SCN in it, a farmer can plow it or they can use a seed drill in it and that contaminated soil will get on the equipment and then get carried to another location and transmit it to a brand new place. Um, obviously, good sanitation will prevent that and we want to make sure we work hard to protect everything. This also means that we can find it in places like seed lots where there may be soil remnants or they can be moved through wind and water. Say you have a storm that has a flood event in it and that soil moves, it gets flooded along and carries the nematode along with it. So I've given you that model to start with. What's this mean for beech leaf disease? Well, ultimately it means that its spread is most likely our fault. We probably brought it here through a contaminated soil product, but we don't know for certain yet. This research is still in its infancy and we're still identifying where it's going and how bad it is. Now next, what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that we all understand how to identify a beech tree too. Um, a lot of us are very familiar with them, but I always like to cover this just in case. It's good not to make assumptions. Now, like I mentioned earlier, beech trees are here in Indiana, though we have a landscape that is dominated by oak and maple. However, I've had the opportunity to see woodlots that includes so many different types of trees. I live in the hardwood areas of Indiana, and I've seen woodlots with things like tulip poplar, elm, black walnut, all sorts of things. And beech trees are a part of that. Now here in Indiana, we typically have the American uh, beech, Fagus grandifloria. We also have Fagus sylvatica, the European beech as well. These trees are pretty widely distributed from the East Coast all the way through the Midwest. We don't value them the same as, say, veneer wood like black walnut. However, beech wood is very easily turned or shaped, so we use it a lot for making furniture and other shaped wood objects. So it has some value, and people will develop it for a retirement nest egg, or people will just plant it because they think beech is pretty, which it is. Now, a little bit on beech tree identification. Let's make sure we all know that, that we're talking about the same trees, right? So first off, I would bring up the quality of the bark. Beech has kind of smooth, pebbly textured bark on it, which is extremely unique. If you look at the trees here in Indiana, our bar all the bark on different trees is kind of craggy or it's got lots of layers to it. However, with beech, it's very smooth compared to those, and that really, really stands out. You can also take a look at the leaves too. The leaves are all even, they have all have these even prominent veins with wavy edges but I would caution you to make sure that you also check for the bark too because when I was out working on making sure I could identify beech, I realized I was about to confuse the leaves for that of a cedar elm that was nearby. 
So make sure that you know what you're talking about when you identify a beech tree. Check the bark. That's really going to be one that stands out. Now beech trees can reach heights of 70 to 80 feet, which is gigantic for a lot of our trees here in Indiana. And they can get a trunk diameter of up to two to three feet. So if you're someone who plans on selling that tree for wood at some point, if that got infected with beech leaf disease, that's a big chunk of change that you just lost. So we want to make sure we protect trees like that. They also typically favor moist so, most, uh, excuse me, moist soil that is well drained. So to me, that means that they're probably in soil textures that have a combination of loamy soil and sandy soils, where you can get that good moisture but can still be drained away relatively easily. And we often find them in mature stands mixed in with sugar maple and yellow birch. And apparently it's so common to find them in that, that they have, that grouping has its own name, the beech, birch, and maple group. Now here are just a couple of leaves to give you an idea of how to tell the difference between our American beech and our European beech. American beech trees, their leaves tend to be more lanceolate, whereas the European ones are more oval shaped, but they both have that kind of wavy leaf edge. They both have those very prominent veins on them. So let's go over now the signs and symptoms of beech leaf disease. So that way we can identify the disease should it enter Indiana. Now the initial symptoms are going to appear as soon as the tree starts leafing out because the pathogen will be overwintering in the leaf tissue and in the buds. Now when the leaves appear, should they come out, you're going to see that the intervenal areas of the leaves are going to become discolored. And it's very easy to see if you look at the leaf with the sun behind it. So the leaf is backlit. And you can do that with the sun or even the flashlight on your phone to take a look. And this will stand out very easily. You can see that the veins themselves aren't discoloring either. It's just the tissue in between. And that's, that's really, really telltale the disease's presence. Another symptom could be leaf crinkling. You'll sometimes will get leaves that are much smaller than what they should be, and they're going to have this unusual leathery texture to them as a result of the disease. But unfortunately, one of the other problems you'll run into as well is that beech leaf disease tends to kill the buds too as overwintering occurs. So the nematodes will be living in those buds and they'll kill them and then move elsewhere in the plant. So sometimes the leaves simply won't open or they'll drop almost as soon as they leaf out. Now, some beech trees may display their symptoms differently depending on species. So for example, if we talk about our European copper beech, they'll have less banding on the leaves, but the leaves will be distorted more often. And if discoloration is present, sometimes you can even see that that discoloration is itself coppery in appearance, which is a little bit different than on an American beech tree. What we can expect to see is that when leaves emerge in, say, May, the trees may experience just a sudden heavy leaf loss due to the infection. Like I said, the nematode will live in the, the buds and the leaves during overwintering, and as soon as leaf out occurs, those leaves have been killed already by the disease, they'll drop right off. The disease will, or I'm sorry, the tree will go ahead and create new leaves, but those leaves are going to appear without banding, but they'll be paler, less robust, and the tree will look less healthy. Even though the disease overwintered in the buds, it's not gone. It didn't fall off entirely with the uh, leaves that have already dropped. It's still in the tree. It's just they overwintered in those leaves and then moved out of them, and the leaves died because of their presence. Now let's talk a little bit about the distribution of this disease. You can see here that it's spread through a lot of states that we often talk about our invasives entering in. Here we can see that it's present in several eastern east coast states, Pennsylvania, and it's even in portions of Canada, Michigan, and Ohio. But the spread is actually a little bit different than what it normally is. So this disease was originally detected in Ohio in 2012, so it had to have moved eastward since then. Normally we see these things start in a state, say like Pennsylvania, which is a major shipping center, and then it'll move westward. But in this case, the opposite happened. Now, since it was detected in 2012, it's since been found in 12 states and in Ontario. And the most recent detection was in Rhode Island and Massachusetts in 2020. Now, think about that for the moment. This doesn't mean the disease stopped moving. In 2020, we had to go into lockdown. So a lot of our efforts at tracking it probably had to go by the wayside during that period of time, and we're still playing catch up with it. 
So remember, your DNR staff in Indiana are working very hard to monitor trees so that way we can get that work done and make sure it doesn't infect trees here in Indiana. So how do we manage beef relief disease? This is where things get a little tricky. This, tree, this disease is fairly new. It's research, it's still in its infancy, and there is a lot of work that still needs to be done to answer some questions that we still have. Um, we are still learning on different options that we can use to manage the symptoms. But one thing that's important to remember is that nematodes can be both beneficial and detrimental. So we can't just spray some kind of blanket nematode killer into our soil. That's going to cost us more than what we want to pay. So we have to be a little bit finely tuned to manage it. Now there is some research in Ohio that's been done that's indicated that using phosphite products, particularly a product called polyphosphite 30, can improve a tree's capacity to defend itself. Now before you all run out to buy that, all this is is potassium fertilizer. So if you look at the bag, it's 0027. This means you don't need to buy that product in particular, you just need that kind of fertilizer. I'm not endorsing any one over the other. Um, you can use that, and some research has indicated that over time it will improve the health of the tree overall and give it a fighting chance against the disease. But, like I said, the research is still in its infancy. We need to learn more and see what other options exist and what the end result is going to be. I also want to reiterate that beech leaf disease is not yet spread into Indiana. But we may have a lot of oak and maple. That may be what you see all the time. We still have a significant population of American and European beech to protect. So we are asking everybody to please be watchful and report if you see something. And if you're curious how you can do that, one of the ways you can do it is by calling 1-866-NO-EXOTIC. That will take you straight to the Department of Natural Resources here in Indiana, so that way you can report it. You can also message me, Bob Bruner, at rfbruner at purdue.edu, or go on to the Report Invasive website or social media to ask questions about it. I also want to encourage everybody to look at a few different resources, including that social media. Um, but also the Purdue Landscape Report, the Emerald Ash Borer University, and Penn State Extension, which has a lot of good information about a lot of these uh, different invasive species. Uh, and with that, I just want to encourage all of you, please, if you see it, report it, ask questions. We are here to help. And I'm going to thank all of you for coming, and I hope to see you at the next one.